I am so honored to be a part of the Calvary Chapel movement way back in the day, uh, getting started back in 1978. I went out there, so it has been 40 years. I left in 84 for New Jersey. So this month, it'll be 40 years we've been out there. And, uh, but I'll tell you, just came back from the memorial with uh, Sharon Reese, and it's in the latest Calvary magazine. Uh, powerful example, you know, she's a great example of someone that, I was just uh, 21 when I went on staff there, and uh, just as a young intern, and uh, Ch- Raul was going to be going to China and the Philippines and Thailand, and I wanted so badly to go with him, so <clears throat> I was afraid to ask him. But I went up to Sharon, and I said, Sharon, would you tell Raul to take me? And of course, uh, you know, it, it's like the woman, she turns the head. So <clears throat> Raul took me. But what she doesn't know is God used that trip in my life to set my heart afire, to reach people, and to get outside of just a living a comfortable life in America and thinking of yourself. And so uh, it inspired me to, take the, to go to the ends of the earth in New Jersey, because uh, that was at the ends of the earth in the 80s. And uh, Chuck Smith, Calvary what, who? I mean, they didn't know anything. But the wild thing is, God has been so faithful, and uh, I'm, I'm so blessed to be a part of that. And, you know, uh, she, Sharon's a good illustration of a person who's a missionary kid, backslidden, marries a crazy man, and then, you know, suffers for it, is abused, cries out to God, and the Lord answers so powerfully that through that salvation, how many people have been touched all through South America, all, all the churches that have gone out from West Covina, it's really been amazing. Well, my passage this morning, if you have your Bibles, turn to John 13. Um, I'm going to read the first five verses, and then kind of just, because the time is short, I'll just express some of the things that are making the point here in the whole chapter. John uh, records now Jesus' public ministry is done in chapter 12, and now he spends his time with his disciples, and this is really the heart of ministry, which is why we do what we do. Before the feast of Passover, when Ju- Jesus knew his hour had come, he always remember, he'd say, my hour hasn't come, my hour's not yet come, my hour's not yet come, now it's come. He knew his hour had come that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that his father had given all things into his hands, that he was come, he'd come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Now, this leads, of course, to Peter's response. Oh, you, are you washing my feet? Well, you don't understand this now. And I could say in ministry... That's a great passage, verse 7. What I'm doing now, you don't understand. Your whole life is going to be that way. There's so many directions, so many things happened. I mean, I just getting here uh, was uh, quite an adventure. Uh, It was a 23 and a half hour trip that should have been one third that. But a record number of delays, a record number of, you know, crazy stuff happening. But here I am. I don't know why, but I can tell you I had a few divine appointments along the way that if nothing else... It was just those people that I was able to talk to about the Lord. Well, Peter, of course, is like, well, you're not going to wash my feet. He still thinks of ministry like just the average person would think of leadership. Like, I'm the one in charge. I'm important. And somebody important shouldn't be doing that. And that is so twisted because that is not a biblical style of leadership. Uh, Jesus, of course, is going to model this for them. And that's what this is. So then, of course, the Lord says, well, then you'll have no part of me. And then Peter wants a whole bath. And it brings a very important point here that Peter is told by Jesus in verse 10, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you're not all clean. So there's a difference between just the cleaning the feet and the practical aspect of that. Um, That wasn't done. It should have been done, but none of the disciples were willing to be the servant to do it. And so Jesus does it, but he's speaking about a different cleansing. The cleansing, when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ and you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, you are justified, you are made clean, you are made holy, you are made accepted before God. By grace, you're saved through faith, and that's not of yourselves. 
But this idea of feet cleaning, you're all clean, but not all of you. He's, it's a dual meaning. He's referring to Judas because he's, he's not his at all. But he's also referring to the fact that even as believers, we pick up defilements in this world. So it, it kind of outlines two of the most important things in our lives. Number one is that your name is written in the book of life. That's the most important thing, that you know whom you've believed and you are there eternally secure because you are made in God's image for a purpose, transcending anything of any value in this world. One soul will outlive all of this world, all of this universe when it's all dust. That one soul is more valuable than the entire world. People do not know how valuable their own soul is. And that's why we need to give the message to them. So, but the second thing of this is that if that's the number one thing, that your name is written in the book of life, is it the second most important thing that you could somehow be used of God to influence someone else to become a believer? Listen, you will never experience, th that ruined me. That's what called me into ministry. I was doing my thing in wrestling in Michigan State. I'm in chemical engineering. I got my plans. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a Christian businessman or a Christian scientist, not in the cult sense, but... <laughs> I, a scientist that's a Christian. I, I'm going to do this for God. And, and I had my plan, and I'm trying to get God on track of where he wants me to go. And uh, then what happened is there was a girl in the apartments I was in. She was going down to do her laundry, and I was coming up, and I just ran into her, and I, I wanted to tell her about the Lord. And she was pretty and thought, you know, she's going to think I'm trying to pick her up, so I got I to gotta find some context. So I got some more laundry to go down there and make it seem like I had more laundry. And, and one thing led to another. I had a conversation with her. She responded to the gospel. She prayed to receive the Lord. And I can't even tell you, it was the first time I had to experience someone really responding to the gospel and praying on the spot. And my life was ruined for anything else. I could never be happy doing anything else. All I could think of was how powerful that was. And the wild thing is, this is, the, this is what... Jesus is now preparing his disciples for. He's showing them that it's not about power control. See, that's how the world looks at power. Get power and you can control people. Jesus models something quite different. It's he, you influence them, you capture their heart. And that's the, that's the cool thing about that. You see, in John 12, when the Lord is basically finishing up this public ministry, he points out unbelief in three different ways. One is it's illogical in verse 37. It's illogical that you don't believe because of all the signs he did and still they didn't believe. Unbelief is also predicted when he said, look, who has believed our report? Quoting Isaiah 53 in John chapter 12, verse 38. And then in John chapter 12, verse 39, unbelief is a sign of judgment. In other words, he will confirm a person who refuses to believe that then they soon can't believe. And that when you harden your heart and harden your heart and harden your heart like Pharaoh, eventually God will harden your heart. Resist grace at your own demise. So the idea here of what Jesus is doing is he wants his disciples to understand that how can you break a barrier that a person is predisposed already to have any authority over him. We are rebellious. We want to do our own thing. I don't want to serve any God. That was me growing up. I walked away from the church. I don't want to serve God. You know, I'm going I'm to be my own man. Jesus, you're cool. I, I'm going I'm to go and, and make a dent on this universe like you did. I mean, that's spoken from the intelligent, deep, theological understanding of a 13-year-old. It's about all I had. But I thought I was, I don't need God. But when I saw others that had the fruit of the Spirit, and in fact, in fact, it was in the wrestling room, I'm watching a guy that, we're getting beat up in that first term in Michigan State. I went from top dog in high school to now just, you know, one of the grunts. And all I could say is that, man, this is killing me. But this guy seemed to always be happy. And when I asked him, why are you so happy all the time? He said, I'm a follower of Jesus. And I went, oh, no, myself. Yeah, I, mean, I, I didn't want to hear that. But I couldn't get it out of my mind. And that's when I, riding home on my bike from wrestling practice that night, I prayed for the first time and said, Lord, if you're there, come into my life. And God had a plan. You know, I didn't realize my grandmother had been praying me for me for years, just like Sharon's parents had been praying for her. 
and maybe you've got a prodigal, maybe you have people in your life that are very dear to you that are not walking with the Lord, don't underestimate the power of prayer. But that power of prayer matched with that example that it's not about you. Um, I, I, I just shared with a, a young pastor who's just getting started, something that is very meaningful for me when I think of ministry. Ministry isn't me getting up and showing off my talents. Ministry is me, you know, bringing my little loaves and fishes to the Lord and saying, Lord, this is all I got. You know, could you multiply it? In fact, honestly, anytime I get up in the pulpit, when I'm walking up, I'm like, Lord, I, I think I've got this. I think I know what you want to say. I've studied it. I, I understand it. But you're God. You know all things. And you know who's going to be here. And you know how it will relate. And there's one of the challenges, I think, that we have. You could have a, you could have a, a ministry that's dedicated in the exposition of Scripture and the understanding of what God is saying and reveal that very faithfully. And then you can have on the other side a church that's more culturally relevant about everything. They're always following the culture, what's cool, what's hip, and they're, but they're not really in the Word of God. I really believe that a, a healthy church has a balance because you have the exposition of Scripture feeding the flock, but you have an application to be made. I think Jesus is now, after everything He's taught them, He's giving them an application for what their life is going to be, how to live in the coming days, because he said in the previous chapter, night is coming when no one can work. I mean, I think we could all look around and go, night is coming, where no one's going to be able to do anything. Um, the powers that be, with their attempt to control with power, there are, they are no match, though we don't see the fruit immediately. But just like Roman, the Roman power, the empire, was essentially conquered by the Galileans. And just like communist Russia was overcome by the church and communist China, though it still wields its power, the, the church in China is healthier than any church in the world. So there's something we need to see in this style of washing feet. We are not unto ourselves. So I don't believe in foot washing ceremonies, and I think um, though you saw it on the movie with Chuck, just keep in mind there was a practical that was a practical lesson for his elders. It had nothing to do with worrying about the dirty feet. He didn't care about the dirty feet, but his elders did because they just bought this new carpet. So they put a sign up, "No bare feet allowed," and he ripped it down, and he began to wash the, the hippies' feet as they came in as a message. So I think Jesus is not really caring how important him. He's ready to go to the cross. Does he really care that the disciples' feet are dirty? No, this is an object lesson, but it's a spiritual cleansing, and this is where I really believe comes from justification and sanctification. One is, you are clean when you believed in the, the Son of God and His death on the cross for you, but you'd pick up dirty feet in this world, and there's a process of growing, becoming more like Him, so that you can influence this world. Look, it's true in pastoral ministry, it's true in leadership, it's true in marriage. If you choose control, husbands, pastors, leaders, over influence, you'll lose influence. But if you choose influence over control, you don't need control. Because when you're living in such a way, people are inspired. Case in point, long after Jesus is gone, he's still influencing the world. And so it is Chuck Smith, for an example. You know, he did not have an ecclesiastical denominational mindset to set this up and control, even with the council that he set up. We're not, we're not controllers. We want to be influential. And there's a big difference. Because no amount of ecclesiastical control and threats and, and you know, threatening from removal and threat for this or threat for that is going to really change the heart. So here we are, you know, uh, how many years into the Calvary Movement? How many years in Calvary Magazine? And Calvary Magazine is just a great example of the lives of those who were touched by God now wanting to reach others. And um, God uses this crazy man to capture some of the photos of that. And some amazing writing of all that stuff that's going on. And again, he has his little loaves and fishes. He's great with the photography. And God used him for that. 
And I'll tell you, we, we use the magazine all the time because it really, you know, the Bible says outdo one another in love. Uh, when you see somebody else doing something, not, though that you don't want to try to copy their methods, but you're inspired to take a chance on something. A lot of ministry I did in uh, radio. I was challenged to do radio. That was the real reason we uh, did not have the building. It wasn't about the Bridge Women's Center. That came much later, by the way. But we, uh, we had an opportunity to get a radio signal in New York City and reach millions instead of this 110 acres we bought and we were going to have this facility built and the whole thing. And the Lord just convicted me. You know, you're going to have your little coffee shop and you're going to do all this little nice stuff. And, you know, and, and I've, I felt, no, Lord, whatever you want to do. So we sold the land. We bought the radio station. And um, the problem is, and you could pray for us on this one. This is a tough one. After 40 years of ministry... We just paid off the radio station this last month. And, but we never were able to get a facility we still lease. And that lease payment is driving me crazy. I'm praying some rich Christian gets saved and just <laughs> takes care of it. But, I mean, that's my flesh thinking, my flesh thinking. Because God will take care of it. I just, I, I hate the fact that we ha don't have as much money we could pour into missions as we, but, you know, the radio station, no regrets on that. 150,000 people listen to it every day, and it's, we just added two more million people to our signal, uh, fighting some court battles, and I'll tell you, God uses that little stuff. So my whole point of this is that, look, we live in a demonically inspired death culture world right now. Um, people do not know some of the things that are happening in our nation uh, when you think of 16,000 hours, your children stand be before teachers in public education and the influence on their little souls, and particularly with the madness that is a part of what's happening in our culture today. It's very concerning. Um, but yet, when has it been ever easy? When was it easy for Elijah? Was it easy, you know, running from Ahab? Uh, was it easy for the disciples in Rome, under Rome's persecution? Uh, when, when is it ever easy? For, was it easy for Abraham and, and wandering through the, wilt, you know, the, the land of Canaan and, and Moses? Uh, was it easy for him, 40 years in the wilderness? As I look, we have this mentality that if God's in it, it'll be easy. And that's not true. If you're thinking, oh, I must be doing something wrong because it's so hard. No, you're probably doing something right. The reality is this is a part of our development. But how we think God will change people is that they need to see something. Well, we see with Jesus. He did all these signs and they still reject it. Elijah also learned that. You know, it, the fire that came down on Mount Carmel that dazzled the people. Oh, Jehovah, he is God. That didn't change the heart. Because Jezebel is now out to kill him and he's running for his life. And then he goes and down in the south, he goes, Lord, just take my life. You know, I'm the only one following you. And the Lord says, listen, I've got 7,000 heaven bowed the knee to Baal. But he had to teach him, you know, listen, go out and listen. And he went out and, you know, this great big earthquake. And then there was a great big wind, there was a great big fire. And the Lord was not in the big shows. And that's how church is sometimes. It's about the big show. The Lord's not in that. But in that still small voice. That, that small voice that speaks to a heart and says, this is the way, walk in it. But they get that voice when they see the example of someone who has that connection with the Father. And, and there's something about that. Pa Peter says, you know, we should always be ready to give a reason for the answer or, or the answer for the reason for the hope. Give, a, give an answer for the hope that's in you. Now, stop and think for a moment. Why would they want a, a reason why would they want a defense, an apologia? We, we get really into apologetics and try to answer all the questions that stumble people. Those questions didn't mean anything to me. They were just smoke screens. When I would argue evolution, I'd argue this, and I'd make fun of Christians about that, and I'd do this. That was just all a smoke screen. Because that all fell when I saw that one wrestler who had hope and peace, and I didn't have. And I asked him for the reason, and the reason was very simple. It's Jesus. So live in such a way that inspires someone to wonder, why, is, why do you have such a hope? 
And listen, this is the perfect time and culture. It happened especially in the time of the hippies where there was such a, a feeling of emptiness and uncertainty. And it's also happening now because normal people are realizing these people are crazy if they want to teach my kids that my little boy can be a girl or my little girl can be a boy. They're crazy when they talk about this diversity and the way they're doing it and, and equity. equity. You know what equity is? It's socialism. And this has been pounded into these kids' minds. This whole critical theory, queer theory. I have, you know, if you have any idea what that is, it's very simple. The queering of American uh, youth in schools is happening right now. And what it simply means is that you people who believe the Bible, you know, were oppressed by the people before you that believe the Bible. And you just were never smart enough to get outside of that oppression and become your own person. But this next generation, they're going to realize that all those powers that oppressed and controlled us and told us that this is what a female should be, she needs to be a woman. No, that's why the Supreme Court Justice couldn't say, answer what is a woman. She knows what a female is, but they don't believe a female has to be a woman. That's, that's a Bible verse that's oppressing people. And the idea of a man, what is a man? This is all a part of this theory, and that's why the drag... You ever wonder, why would they want to have these drag queen things? It's purposeful to help them break those stereotypes and those ideas of what has been normal, forced by you Christians, and you were stupid from the people that forced it upon you to accept it. And that's what they're being taught, and that's why they're being told, you know, all of these things. So here's the thing. How can you fight this? In a way, it's, it's a beautiful picture because normal people, normal parents, normal workers, they see this as crazy. And they're looking for people that have hope in the midst of it. And they're going to wonder why you have that hope. The world is going crazy. How many conversations have you had with strangers along those lines? You know, man, it's so crazy now. What's, it's crazy, it's crazy. You're cra you know, stop bemoaning how crazy it is. Show that hope that you have in Christ. Because you know where this is going to go. Look, look, evil in every generation, it seems to grip, but it has a short shelf life. And the culmination of the greatest evil empire in the world will be when the Antichrist finally takes control in the tribulation, right? Have you done the math on that? For centuries, they've been plotting and planning, and they come with a whoop de doo of three and a half years of real control, before they get like completely obliterated with all of the, the plagues. Three and a half years of power, how short-lived that is. See, we should be not worried and fretting about all these evil things around us. We should be walking in boldness and courage. Um, listen, you, know, you, you have no idea the impact that you can have just by having a solid biblical fr framework and every generation that's announced the death of Christianity has, has basically fallen to the Galilean. Um, I think of uh, Voltaire, you know, I mean, he had, he had turned over in his grave, the guy who basically was just the anti-Christian philosopher par excellent. Uh, but when they sold his home, they turned it in, they, a Bible society bought it and printed Bibles. He, he predicted that Christianity would be a dead within 100 years. And 100 years to the date, his, bi his home was being used to print Bibles. Stalin's daughter came solid in the Lord. Uh, again, you know, look, the, the world will oppress, suppress the truth and unrighteousness. But it can't stop the power of the Holy Spirit working through the lives of believers who figured out who they are and they're not intimidated by the world and they're not afraid. I mean, right now we have the government of New Jersey coming after us because we're saving babies. They're trying to uh, basically say we're lying to them. They're, they're, they're actually saying that uh, they want to take us to court because they're, they're saying that you can actually take a reversal to the abortion pill. And guess what? You can take a reversal pill and stop that. It has to be done in a few days, but we've done it. We've done it successfully with a number of, of women. And it, I got to tell you, it's powerful, this. So when I look at Jesus, again, I, I know you guys get expositions here all the time, very solid expositions if you're in a Calvary ministry, so I'm not really expounding this. I'm showing how Jesus is preparing his disciples 
that by doing this, to think about how their whole lives are now not men for themselves, but how they can, that's the definition of a servant. You exist to make somebody else's life better. And that's what you are as a believer. You're a servant now. Lord, where do you want me to serve? You know, here's my loaves and fishes. Unless you multiply it, I got nothing. And I may not understand how all this works now, but the Lord will show me. And so later Jesus essentially does this. But I, I love this in, in this whole context. And I'm going to close with this thought. It's all in the backdrop of Judas's betrayal. Jesus could have stopped that. But you see, that's a part of it. Judas plays his part. You see, he's, he's going to take these empty vessels, his disciples, he's going to fill them, he's going to use them, but it's going to be in the context there's always going to be a Judas, there's always going to be a Demas who forsakes this, you know, the Lord for the present world. There's going to be a Hithophels who are bitter and they're going to go after you. You're going to have all these detractors in your life. Why are you surprised? Because those things are used by God to equip you, to deepen you. When I was serving as an intern with Rawl, I, I'm, I look back, I thought I made a mistake, but now I look back, I'm thankful for it. But I made the mistake to confront Rawl's main assistant. I'm a 22-year-old kid, he's like 40-something. But he did something that we were told not to, and that is to be in your office alone with a woman. And we were said never to do that. So I said, why do you do that? You tell us not to do it. And he said, none of your business. So at 21, I said, I said, well, I, God gave me this boldness. I felt a boldness. I said, well, you know, I'm going to tell Raw. And he goes, you go over my head, you little punk. I'll get you out of this ministry faster than you can blink. And the Lord gave me a holy boldness and said, God put me in this ministry, not you, and only God can remove you, me, remove me. And I walked away thinking, put him in his place. <laughs> well, I was a little naive to realize that everything was going to go on normal at that point. Because for the next four years, he made my life miserable. But I wish I could get a hold of him now and thank him for that. Because that trained me more than anything. The pain, the struggle of working hard and not being acknowledged, uh, giving the lowest jobs, you know, treated like a grunt for four years while other interns were raised up and did glorious things. I look back and I go, Lord, I could not have gotten a better ministry training. And I'm so thankful for that. But you allowed that, Judas. You allowed that pain. You allowed that circumstance. You allowed that difficulty. Whatever that might be, you're facing. Look, look, at, look at the Calvary Magazine, some of the stories of pain and struggle. In fact, I think we need to do more of those kinds of stories. We're always covering the cool ministry things, Tom. Maybe you need to go in and talk about what, I mean, you did that with Sharon, obviously, but that's cool in the re end result. But there's so many stories of pain and difficulty and struggle, how God eventually turned it into good. Because that really is the power of grace. That's really what, the only thing that can change people's lives. It's His grace. I'm going to close with my second closing. <laughs> my final closing. Because I'm already over time. I, I started late, but I still am over three minutes of my time. And I, I'm making you guys lose a little of your dinner time. Unless my good friend John gives you a little break. But I have to say this. Actually, I forgot what I was going to say <laughs> with all that little meandering. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your amazing grace. I thank you for, Lord, just the joy that we can have in gathering together, thinking about your word, thinking about how we can make an impact on our culture. Use us for your glory, Lord. I pray you pour your spirit out, Lord, and move uh, more and more in this very tumultuous time to let your people's hope shine, that people want to know where are you growing, where are you, where are you getting your peace. Lord, that we can give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen.